So thank you. Um, based on my own life's pattern recognition, I would guess there's a 17% chance that one or both of those drinks spills on my computer during the talk. Um, can everyone hear me in the back? Oh, so this is on then, yeah? All right, so um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with an economics example um, about biases. And there's something in uh, uh, economics called the anchor effect, which if you have a uh, $500 grill and a $200 grill, consumers will, the vast majority, choose the $200 grill. But if you introduce a third item, a really expensive grill, like a $5,000 grill, a lot more people buy the intermediate priced uh, item. So kind of my reason for being here tonight is that uh, we have Fox News and Jeremy, and uh, I am the $5,000 grill, so Jeremy's views are a little, a little more uh, believable. So um, we are exposed uh, every day to um, major amounts of, of stimuli from the news and the media and the, our friends and our Facebook and our, our email about what's wrong with the world, what's going on, what we should pay attention to. And um, I think what I've tried to do is, over the last decade or so, parse these things down into first principles, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, tonight. And my objective is not to be liked so much in this talk. I could have created a talk that everyone would laugh and like me. I'm going to try and tell more of the truth and, and give you some maybe insights about our situation. So uh, the things that I'm going to present um, could probably be uh, you know, a dozen or so PhD theses, and you're not going to hear them from the experts in society because these, um, the synthesis um, aren't found in reductionist expertise, and most of the experts in our world are, are reductionist, and that's because their jobs depend on it. So I'm going to give you a little sliver, uh, shallow but very wide story. And this is, if you know about a hologram, if you have a small piece of the hologram, you can actually see the whole hologram. And if you come away from tonight, don't worry about remembering everything I've said. But if you remember that there's a rich breadth of, of disciplines involved in our human situation, then I'll have succeeded. So these are, are some of the topics that are relevant to uh, modern society. And as I was saying, there's, there's no unifying um, thread that goes through all these, except maybe economic theory. Um, so I'm going to, um, piece by piece, go through some of these and try to connect uh, the dots between them. So uh, I'm going to talk about energy, money, debt, human behavior, the environment. I'm going to synthesize it, what it means for our likely future and then have some uh, philosophical questions about how we transition from teenagers to adults as a species. And then I'm going to talk about what I'm doing and what maybe some recommendations for the university or you as individuals. So let's start with energy. So energy is um, the driver of processes in nature. And at every point, there is an energy input and a, and a thermodynamic loss. The sun comes in, uh, hits the um, ground, uh, photosynthesis happen happens, uh, net primary productivity grows, um, gazelles and other animals eat uh, the, the, the grass, and there's a heat loss at each, at, at each point. And then further up the trophic chain, there are predators that go towards the um, uh, gazelle, and there's also a heat loss there because they expend calories and everything. Nature. Uh, needs energy. And the same is true in the human system. Um, well, before I get to that, the uh, maximum power principle, as some people think, is the fourth law of thermodynamics, which states that organisms and ecosystems self-organize in a way to access more available energy. And in, in this situation, this is a, a forest transect in a redwood grove. And the coolest areas, as measured by a thermal scan, are those that um, are the tallest trees because they are degrading the incoming sunlight. The warmest areas are the path where there's nothing growing and the heat just comes right in and heats up the ground. So this ecosystem has grown in order to degrade uh, the most effective sunlight possible. Now in the human system, 
energy is as much of a driver. Um, no matter how you make a cup, you first need an energy precursor. Whether it's ceramic or coconut or aluminum, you always need energy first. For any single good and service in our economy, you need an energy investment first. And human civilization is a, is a history of um, harnessing ecosystem service flows and turning them into um, products that we use, mostly food. Uh, but uh, incoming sunlight combines with soil and rain and produces things that, that we eat, and we've gotten better and better at that over time. If you look at um, energy use, it's incredibly correlated with GDP, which is gross domestic product, which is a measure of, of the throughput of our economies. If you look at um, usable energy, which is the actual electricity that was burned to do a toaster or a refrigerator or air conditioner, the relationship is around 98%. So energy and GDP are almost synonymous on a global level. So here's uh, everything on this slide is um, costs about $100. Designer jeans, sushi, uh, boots, uh, sunglasses, a $100 bill, some tequila, and a barrel of oil. Now, our standard economic textbooks teach us that all these things are worth $100 and that they're interchangeable because their value is $100. But the truth is, is that energy, particularly oil in this example, is incredibly special because one barrel of oil costs $70 to get out of the ground, is then marked up and sold to us at $100 or you know, thereabouts. Um, we do that because we can, but in that one barrel of oil is 5.7 million British thermal units of energy. And that translates to 1,700 kilowatt hours of work. And me digging ditches or hauling mulch or doing physical labor does about six or seven tenths of a kilowatt hour of energy uh, of work per day. And if you do the math of that, one barrel of oil displaces 11 years of a human working. And at the average American salary of $44,000 a year, one barrel of oil, which we pay $100 for in our economic system, displaces $500,000 of American human labor and about $140,000 of the average human labor. So this is basically indistinguishable from, from magic. The average American has around 60 barrel of oil equivalents of fossil energy slaves walking behind us unknown to us in the form of coal, oil, and natural gas. They don't complain, they don't talk, we're not even aware that they're there, uh, but some of you at being at an environmental school know that we've discovered that they breathe and they poop, uh, and we're starting to have to deal with that. So this is uh, a picture from my farm. Um, this is me, one-tenth of a horse. Uh, that's my horse, which is one horse. Um, the utility vehicle is 45 horse and the truck is 150 horse. This is the, the, what fossil magic has allowed us to do is the incredible energy density um, in gasoline allows us to do amazing things that we didn't used to be able to do. This amount of diesel fuel or, or gasoline can power my truck, this is what, a pint, um, for eight miles, it'll push. Uh, that truck seven to eight miles down the road. I mean, think about how much it would take us pushing that truck eight miles. So the story of um, industrialization is largely one of adding large amounts of fossil energy um, in an energy inefficient way towards um, numerous processes that humans used to do by hand. And then we invented a lot of new mechanization processes. When we drive a car, we use, depending on the boundaries, 100 to 1,000 times more energy than walking, if you include the roads and everything, and we get there 10 times faster. So we did something a little faster, but we put huge amounts of energy towards it. Um, let me give you a, a Wisconsin example. Think about milking cows. So on the left, um, you do 30 minutes a cow per day manual milking. Uh, in the middle, there's a semi-automatic milking machine. It requires 15 units of, uh, 15 minutes of human labor, but also 300 kilowatt hours uh, per cow. Um, and on the right is a fully automated system, only three minutes per day uh, per cow, and, but a lot more energy, 700 kilowatt hours. But since electricity and energy are so cheap, what happens is 
the uh, wages on the first example are $3 an hour, in the middle example are $5 an hour, and the, uh, the right example is $15 an hour. You could either have wages or higher profits or lower priced milk or some combination thereof. So energy is a big driver of, of our economies. Um, what happens in this graph is that uh, the more energy we add, we could add 1,000 units or 2,000 units or something, but eventually we add so much energy that the benefits to humans break down. The scale on the left is wages, and in the red graph is 5 cent kilowatt hour energy. And the more units of labor we add on the bottom um, gives us higher and higher wage benefits for humans until we add over 400 units, and then it starts to break down. But what's important about this is as energy prices go up, um, the yellow and the purple lines, um, those benefits to humans break down sooner, especially with very energy intensive industries like aluminum, uh, et cetera. Standard economics tells us that over time things get cheaper and because we are more efficient and we're smarter about how to make things like toasters and we outsource uh, the production to uh, areas that are, are cheaper. Uh, and they, uh, standard economics textbooks assume energy follows the same trajectory, but energy follows a different trajectory because it's, it's finite and we are trying to get the um, more costly stuff. And so in the 1930s, we had um, oil bubbling up by the ground like the Beverly Hillbillies, and we invested one barrel of oil and we got 100 back. By the 1970s, we had to drill way deeper in the ground, started to go into the oceans, um, and that ratio went down to 30 to 1. And by the year 2000, that ratio was in the mid-teens. Irrespective of oil price, energy has an energy cost. Um, real quickly, you can see that some of the major oil companies have flattish to declining production, but their expenditures to find and develop oil are skyrocketing. Um, the graph on the left, the yellow line, shows the average extraction cost for all the oil majors in the world. And in the year 2000, it was $10 a barrel. That's the average cost for the companies to break even. Last year, it was $120. So they're finding it more and more difficult. Extraction costs for oil have gone up 17% a year for the last 13 years. The right graph shows the break-even fiscal cost for um, all the governments in OPEC, and it's over $100. Okay, so this is uh, um, kind of a representative price of energy for the world. Um, it's Europe, uh, but the bottom line is coal, uh, the red line is natural gas, and the top line is oil. And basically where we stand today is electricity prices are two and a half to three times higher above the historical inflation adjusted average, and oil is four to, four to five times higher than the inflation adjusted historical trend. And since 10 energy calories go into every food calorie, you might imagine that um, oil price increases translate to food price increases, and that is the case. Um, Real quickly, the uh, benefits to Americans and other countries have started to decline um, because of expensive energy. We have uh, peaked in vehicles registered, new vehicle purchases, and average vehicle miles traveled around six or seven years ago. So if we get back to nature in optimal foraging theory, the amount of energy uh, received from a prey versus how much you invested that ratio tells us how much surplus we can have. And the same thing in human situations. So if you consider that energy costs 5% of our GDP, that means 5 out of 100. That means there's 95 or 19 out of 20 left for other things like universities and Disneyland and NASCAR, et cetera. So if energy goes from 5% to 10% of GDP, our benefits go down from 19 to 9 units. And this is what's happening right now as energy extraction costs go up. Um, we are building a bigger mousetrap. Renewables aren't displacing fossil fuels. We're just adding to the whole size. So in the last 25 years, renewables um, have not grown as much as fossil fuels. 
Um, they're starting to grow faster, but the aggregate amount is still very small. Um, and then there's something called Jevons Paradox, which says that as long as economic growth is our objective, that energy that we save here is going to be used somewhere else in the system. And that is, that is the case. So this is a graph showing energy uh, consumption globally the last 200 years. And the little beige part on the bottom is uh, biomass. Um, when I lived in Vermont, they showed me where basically the entire New England states were completely denuded in the 1860s because that's when population had started to go up. We were growing as a nation and there wasn't fossil fuels yet. And so they cut down trees, clear cut everywhere for fuel, timber, um, et cetera. Um, then you can see that we found oil, uh, natural gas, uh, nuclear and hydro are the little slivers on the top. Um, and basically we are, are continuing to grow our, our energy consumption. Okay, now to talk just about energy um, doesn't become really clear what's going on unless you integrate um, our monetary system. So what is money? Money is a claim on future natural resources, particularly energy. Because the things that we really want um, required energy to get there. So financial capital, when we talk about stocks and bonds and commodities and retirement accounts and all those things, are financial markers. And those are markers for real capital. Real capital is uh, natural capital, which is uh, our, our streams and our forest, and this is my backyard and uh, healthy ecosystems. Uh, social capital, which is our friends and our networks um, and our family, in this case, my family, my dogs. Uh, built capital, which is historically uh, embodied energy in stuff. This is my house, uh, solar panels and chainsaws and uh, deck chairs, etc. And then finally, human capital, which is our skills and our health and our knowledge and our abilities. Uh, this is me identifying a wild mushroom, and there's my dad, uh, who knows how to fix broken knees and plant carrots. Uh, but, but financial capital is really just a marker for this type of capital. So how does money come into existence? This is an interesting and, and uh, bizarre and actually frightening story. When you go to a local bank and you want to borrow $150,000 to start a new business and they check you out and you're credit worthy and you look trusting, they will approve the loan and something interesting happens. $150,000 enters your account at the same time uh, an asset on the bank balance sheet of $150,000 that you owe them. Those happen simultaneously. Nowhere in the system did $150,000 of purchasing power leave. So at that moment, the amount of money in our economy went up by $150,000 when natural resources and energy, the real things that power our economy, stayed the same. Now this worked and this was fine for a long time because we live in a country that had more energy and natural resources than any country in the history of the world. Don't ever forget that the last 10 years, the last 30 years, the last 50 years, the last 200 years, the last, since the dawn of time, America has burned more energy than any country in the world. And in order to access that and all of our inventions and everything, we had to continually put more money into the system. And that was fine for a long time, but at some point, we were adding too much money relative to natural resources. I'm gonna quickly go through that. So, um, I'm gonna go real fast on this. This is from a book written 80 years ago. Um, and the amount above the zero line from A to B is real wealth. And the amount from B to C below the, the middle line is virtual wealth, what people think they have digitally or contracts or credit or things like that. And over time, wealth and virtual wealth both increase, um, as you can see here, over time. And, the virtual wealth ends up being a claim on the next iteration. Um, so that's all okay. But what happened here is in this country since 1966, we've grown our debt, corporate, government, household, private, personal, more than we've grown our GDP every single year. GDP is the black line on the left graph and debt is the red line. And what this means is, is that for every additional dollar of debt, we're getting less and less GDP. And the right line, the right graph shows that trend over time. 
is the more debt we're adding, the less bang for the buck we're getting. And anything under one to one is, is unsustainable. And now we're at like 20 cents per dollar or less. The same thing is happening for every other country in the world. Since 1971, no country has had a currency tethered to natural resources, and we're adding more and more debt. We've added around $50 trillion in debt since, 19, uh, since 2007, and global GDP is only around $60 trillion. So when we consider that debt productivity is declining, what's happening in this graph I showed before is that virtual wealth is growing faster and faster. Um, so um, we're in a paradoxical situation where our real cost of capital is energy. And that is the driver of societies. And that's increasing quite a bit. But our, what decision makers and policy people are saying is, we're looking at the 10-year um, the treasury rate, which is the declining line, as if our cost of capital is, is getting cheaper. So we're making decisions based on the wrong metric. Um, so let me summarize uh, debt in, in two different lenses. One is the fact that there's a zero-sum game. There's a creditor, a rich guy, and a debtor, a poor guy. And over time, it's, it is a zero-sum game because What's happened in this country is, is wealth inequality has continued to increase. Um, but from another lens is all of this money is coming into the world um, relative to energy and natural resources, which are staying the same. And in this sense, it's a Ponzi scheme. Um, if there was, a, uh, if there was a, a helicopter that came over um, Stevens Point and dumped $5 billion out, a lot of people would grab 100 grand or 300 grand or 50 grand and people would be buying trucks and going on vacations and building mansions. And all this would happen with no, so all that energy and resources, uh, energy prices would go up and local construction would go up and there would be a boom. But when that money flew out of the helicopter, there was no relationship with energy and natural resources. So in that moment, we are using energy and resources that would have been available to us in the future that we use them right then. And that's what's happening to the world right now with uh, central banks taking over the, um, the, the financial markets with too big to fail guarantees, artificially low interest rates, um, uh, quantitative easing, et cetera. Okay, moving on to um, th this, this talk is gonna kind of snowball into the more interesting stuff, but I think we have to understand where we are in kind of an insolvent situation um, before we get into the, this stuff. Okay, so human behavior. We are risen apes, not fallen angels. And we have DNA in common, uh, our cells, with every living organism. Yes, bonobos and chimps, but also bananas and spiders and dogs. That may, need, may not be that hard to believe, actually. Um, so this is our family tree uh, from when we split off from, from the other apes. These are our ancestors. And it's important to remember that our brains evolved largely in a time of privation when we did not have uh, a lot of excess. And so um, for many, many hundreds, if not thousands of generations, Things were pretty stable and our social and, and living situations dominated how our brains were sculpted and how we hunted and, and got resources dominated the wiring of, of what we have become. So I like to think of, uh, of our brains as, as three systems, the, the neocortex, which is thinking about mortgage payments and midterm exams, uh, sitting on top of the limbic system, which is our mammalian emotion, emotional system, sitting on top of a rep reptilian system, which is our fight or flight. And when they all three work together, you can accomplish amazing things. But sometimes when you're not paying attention, the older systems will kind of take off and do their own thing. Um, so um, there's something called a steep discount rate. So scientists uh, say that we have uh, the initial conditions for an environmental and economic disaster. And the more research they do, they say, actually, we're 90% confident that we're to blame and that there's a, there's a real bad um, risk coming down the line. 
And now we're entirely sure and people better start to prepare. And we've advised Stevens Point City Council that there's an economic and environmental calamity and holy crap, Godzilla is in Stevens Point. We don't react until we see the crisis in our face. And you can imagine why this is for evolutionary reasons. If there's an organism that defers immediate consumption, um, it will have been out reproduced by organisms that ate things right away. Most people, um, most organisms in nature absolutely prefer the present versus the future. A discount rate is how much we prefer the present more than the future. And Americans, especially because of our pell-mell um, stimulation-laden culture, really prefer the present more than the future. This is unlikely that that's what she's thinking. Okay, status, sexual selection. So, um, hierarchy and, sorry about that, and um, status is ubiquitous in nature. If you think about what goes into the construction of this peacock tail, that peacock required more energy, more bugs, more minerals in order to create this tail, number one. Number two, that tail made him more conspicuous to a predator. Number three, if that predator um, saw him, this would be less likely for him to get away. All three of those negative fitness hits are overcome by the drab female peahen's preference for an ornate and showy tail. In nature, in biology, this is called the handicap principle, uh, which some biologists say that waste is evolutionary selected for. Um, and of course, this uh, is, happens in human systems as well, um, where a yacht, world record yacht, is continually beat by like three or four feet the following year. So here is an interesting uh, experiment done by an ecological economist. Um, would you prefer a 4,000 square foot house if all of your neighbor's houses were bigger, 6,000 square feet? Or would you prefer a 3,000 square foot house, a smaller house where all your neighbor's houses were even smaller then? The vast majority of people would prefer a smaller house as long as it was bigger than their neighbor's houses. And you laugh because you know you see this so many times in your life uh, that we compete not for absolute stuff. We're fantastically rich as a nation, as a species, but we compete with others. Um, the uh, social critic H.L. Mencken had a, a, a funny line where he said, a wealthy man is someone who makes $1 a year more than his wife's sister's husband. And there's, there's some truth to that. So in nature, um, consumption and... Uh, is, has a negative feedback. If a lion were to eat three impalas, the third one would get stuck in his esophagus. If a deer grows antlers too big, they would fall over. But in human systems, there are positive feedbacks. There, there is not a natural break when we run in a digital economy where more and more digits in the bank make people feel like more, uh, you know, more powerful, et cetera. We do things because we can. So, um, Neural addiction, habituation. So they did studies on thirsty monkeys where they attached uh, headphones uh, and played a tone while they squirted juice unexpectedly into the monkey's mouth. And the dopamine neurons, dopamine is a measure, uh, uh, part of the neural reward superhighway um, correlated with reward, all of a sudden went from three to 60 per, per second. It was like, whoa, that was good. And I didn't expect it when the tone was played. And gradually, when the tone played and they got the squirt of juice, that number of dopamine neurons gradually receded because the monkey was still getting the juice and he still liked the juice, but it was no longer unexpected. And once it becomes expected, it becomes boring and it's not as big of a driver of our behavior. So it's the unexpected reward, the novelty we get from, oh, I got, look at who I got a, an email from, or I've never found this before, or the other day I was out um, finding, uh, trying to find agates and I found the first agate of my life, it's in my pocket right now, um, and I was like, yes, because I, my girlfriend loves finding agates and I'd never found one. In that moment, my brain, if there was a functional MRI, would have looked like I had just done cocaine. It would have not been distinguishable. So speaking of brains, so um, the wanting feels better than the having is actually something Spock said in a Star Trek movie, but it's actually true um, from neuroscience because the dopamine system is stronger than the opioid system. 
So in Mayo Clinic, there's something called Parkinson's disease, which is a reduction in dopamine in certain areas of the brain. So they give you a drug called Mirapex, which boosts your dopamine, but not only in that one area, but all areas of the brain. And what happened is they found um, uh, dozens of Mirapex patients. A church pastor would come in and he had like 11 extramarital affairs and he had never cheated in his life. A woman who was just a little old conservative lady lost her entire $150,000 life savings gambling at India's casinos. The extra dopamine made them consumptive uh, uh, junkies. So we think about the decisions we face every day. Um, exercise, watch TV, salad, burger. There's always a better choice and a less better choice. When we have neural high watermarks that keep getting ratcheted up, what happens is these decision trees kind of get tilted down until our behaviors go towards, towards that list. <laughs> Cognitive biases. So we are self-deceptive by nature. Confidence and optimism have been adaptive. Ninety-some percent of college professors think they're better than average. A million out of a million college entrants, high school students, said they're better than average at getting along with others. Um, being optimistic is one bias because being optimistic um, suppresses cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it increases um, helper T cells, which help our immune system. So we are biased. Um, I, I put this on here because I gave a talk to a food audience the other night, and we think that we're so clever and that our prosperity comes uh, from our technology and everything, but and when we're adding 10 calories of fossil energy for every one food calorie, the weight in this room, the human biomass, is actually the 80% uh, of the nitrogen in our bodies is directly from natural gas via the Heber-Bosch process directly on us, fossil fuels. Um, and 50% of our protein is directly from natural gas. So there are multiple cognitive biases, um, hundreds and hundreds. I talked about the anchor effect before, um, the framing effect. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through them all, but there are literally hundreds of biases. And so what ends up happening is people are extremely confident about whatever their thing is. Uh, it happens in religion, uh, limits to growth, Ford versus Chevy is a silly one, climate change versus denial. If someone says, I think climate change is a hoax, they believe that the same way that those in this room are very concerned about climate. When I say this is a cup of water, I really believe this is a cup of water, and it is. My brain looks the same as a priest saying, I believe in God. The areas in the prefrontal cortex light up are the same. So we um, have very, very strong beliefs about everything. Stephen Hawking is one of the most brilliant astrophysicists ever to have lived. He thinks the answer to climate change is that we need to colonize the moon and Mars. This is an example of delusional reductionist thinking, because any fifth grader would say, well, how are we gonna do that? But that is just one example of how experts are super brilliant in their area, but they can't synthesize the whole picture. So I, I took a picture of this bumper sticker, um, and I do think that we are delusional, and we have to be delusional in order to be happy and functional. Um, the problem isn't so much that we're delusional, it's that we're delusional about being delusional. And we've reached a time in, in human history and with our environmental situation that we can't afford that. So summing up on the um, human behavior side, we're not going around thinking, how do I get more of my genes into the next generation? What happens is all of what came before, we were fitness maximizers. And the day we were born, we look out into America 2014 and say, how do I get status and resources and social power in this environment? And we follow the environmental cues. At that point, we become adaptation executors. And the currency is brain chemicals, neurotransmitters, endocrine system. Um, so all of these things shout very loud. The brain is a physical system. It functions like an analog computer. And there are multiple purposes, uh, modular units within the brain, and they shout really loud. And the ones that shout louder, that's the behavior that happens. 
I he am here ostensibly to talk to you about a lecture, and I'm being erudite and polite, but if I had to go to the bathroom, there would be something shouting, you gotta pee, dude, you gotta leave, and that would overtake what this, this other process. So what unfortunately happens is that these things shout louder than biodiversity and climate change and oil depletion. Um, this is a problem in our country because um, Neil deGrasse Tyson's show Cosmos, these people in Oklahoma City were going, they, they, they vowed to sec D from the union if that show wasn't canceled. Um, only 30% of Americans even believe that evolution happened. And you don't have to believe in evolution to understand what I'm saying. These things uh, are the formative drivers of our behavior. It's just a richer story if you know where we came from and what, uh, what drives us. Okay, uh, it's Earth Week. Um, I'm gonna start talking about the environment. Um, and it's kind of sad that only during Earth Week can I feel like I get away with, with saying the things I'm about to say. Uh, remember, 45 year, this is the 45 year anniversary of Earth Day. And back in 1969, or 1970, 10 million Americans came out in support of Earth Day because they were concerned about pollution and the environment. And now we have to have little kind of closeted rooms with our friends to talk about this stuff. That's messed up. Um, so uh, another problem with economic theory is they say that the environment is part of the economy. Well, obviously, we know that the economy is actually part of the environment. We breathe air. Um, and there are other things that the economy doesn't provide that nature provides for us. Uh, depending on the boundaries we use between 20 and 35 percent of the net primary productivity on the planet, um, we are only one species. There are between 20 and 200 species dying every day, going extinct. We are undergoing the sixth great extinction uh, right now, irrespective of climate. So most of you in this room are familiar with the climate change um, curves and information. Uh, the top graph is CO2. Um, CO2 has not been that high for uh, 20 million years. Um, the pH uh, on the bottom graph is of the ocean and that's declining, uh, almost getting to an acidic ocean at, at eight. Um, and and this, is, this is a concern. I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I have about 10 or 11 people I know that are, including four that are on IPCC panel, and they're very, very scared about um, what they're seeing. Um, this is emissions in the, um, the last 40 years. The blue line is, uh, is um, carbon emissions, and the red line is the growth rate of those emissions. You can see the little jag in 2008, which was the, the Great Recession. Um, this is uh, the top four countries, almost 60% of global emissions, the U.S., India, China, and the European Union. And you can see that China and India are exploding higher in, in emissions. So this is the, um, the panel of IPCC shows under various scenarios where the temperature increase is going to be in the next 100 years. Uh, again, I'm not a climate scientist, but one thing I can say is that all of the scientific literature almost all of it, focuses on what's called transient climate uh, sensitivity, which is at that year, 2050 or 2100, this is what the climate will do. But there's also Earth's uh, equilibrium, which is after the albedo and some of the um, different feedbacks get measured, and then there's Earth's system uh, uh, sensitivity, which is many hundred years in the future. Why should we only care about what happens in 2050 when there's 500 years more built into the pike of what's gonna happen. But for policy reasons, or I don't know what reasons, we're only focused on the transient, which is the earlier one. So obviously in 2100, things aren't gonna just stop. So we have to care about what happens uh, even after that. So it's not just, um, it's not just climate. Um, we are impacting the, the biodiversity and, and the planet in many other ways. Uh, the top left graph is uh, shark fins that they were starting to get flack for having them dry on the sidewalks in Hong Kong, so they started to put them on the roofs. Um, the, the next graph was a few months ago. The, the fishing had been poor in, in Chile, so they, they used uh, dynamite to, to, to get more fish because it was a poor harvest, and this is kind of the, the externality of, of that fishing operation. I'm sure many of you have seen a lot more examples like this. So um, 
if you weigh all seven billion humans on the planet, we are a um, hundred and ten million tons. All of our livestock are uh, over 340 million tons, and wild animals are 10 million tons. Humans and our livestock outweigh wild animals by 50 to 1. So, tuna is the top of the food chain in the ocean, and 90% of pelagic fishes are gone. And one of the reasons this is, is because it's very cheap. They are solar concentrators. They eat smaller fish, which ate the photosynthesis in the ocean. And we have these energy ships that go and, and catch them. Um, but we're doing this in an ecological perspective. Eating tuna for protein is the ecological equivalent of eating lion for hamburger. And we do it because we can. Um, so if you think about economic growth as the top of the glacier that's out of the water, um, the green line is increasing over time. Uh, one of my mentors and idols, Herman Daly, suggested that when marginal costs meet, uh, exceed marginal benefits, we've entered a period of uneconomic growth. And a lot of the costs of our economic enterprise are below the water. They're underneath the glacier, the red line. So we are currently in a period of uneconomic growth. OK, so now we get to synthesis, tying these things together. Where are we at? What's going to happen? What's the future? So this is a um, historical timeline, geologic time on the top graph. Uh, the last 20 million years, uh, largely when we evolved in the middle graph. And the bottom graph is the last 12,000 years of the agricultural revolution. Uh, the black line on the bottom that kind of moonshots up to the top is population of humans. But it just as easily could be energy use and, and very close uh, GDP. So what happened basically in point A is we found an unbelievable 777 lottery jackpot of fossil energy and have been uh, accessing it ever since. Period B is largely the, the last 50 years or so when we designed economic theories to explain what was happening. And those economic theories were based on, of course, the last 50 years or so when everything was going like this. So in nature, um, independent from humans, ants evolved to be what's called an eusocial or ultrasocial uh, species. And ants have a division of labor where the needs and wants of the individuals are suppressed so that the hive has a surplus. This is an example of a leaf cover ant where they bring leaves back and grow a fungus off of the leaves and then they eat. And they act in unison as a hive, different workers and queens and, and warriors, etc. And I would argue that um, that humans um, are also an ultra-social species. That when we stopped hunter-gatherer lifestyle about 12,000 years ago, um, which is labeled here as point C on the graph, we started to um, stop uh, doing things independently. We outsourced some of our brain material to the cloud. Um, in other words, um, our brains have been growing for millions of years until 12,000 years ago. We've kind of had an idiocracy thing going on and our brains are 10% smaller because the, the, the hive the human hive, the whole human society, has been growing surplus, and we're kind of part of that machine. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's an issue. So I, I want to be clear that um, both in evolution and in human societies, there's no, like, super conspiracy or plan, like, this is what we want to do. The game is the plan. We pass the baton on to the next iteration or the next quarter or the next month. And there really isn't a plan. In, in other words, there's really no one to blame um, for what's happening. It's just this is kind of the natural progression of where we, we, we've come. Maybe on Greenspan a little bit. But. Um, OK, so back to this graph. Um, for the 200 years leading up to point A, we added more and more cheap energy to uh, a, an empty and growing system. 
And energy return on investment peaked in the 1950s or 60s. And by the time we went to the 70s, there was a, an energy crisis. And in order to keep the, the spigot growing for energy for the hive, we went to debt and to globalization as a way to keep growing our energy. We started printing money coming um, out of, of, of thin air, and we went to develop economic um, opportunities in other countries. That continued until around 2007 when we had a very close financial Armageddon. And since then, we've had central banks uh, buying sovereign credit, buying our own bonds. We have uh, the US government is buying 38 or 40 percent of our own debt. Um, and that's continued. We're doing everything possible in order to continue access to energy, kind of like the maximum power principle. Um, and now we're starting in, in point D to change the definitions of what is GDP, what is CPI, et cetera. So what does this mean for the future? Uh, we've gotten to this point. Um, I don't know what the future will be, but I know pretty confidently what it won't be. And I think business as usual has now become a utopian fantasy. I don't think we have too many years left of this. Um, there's a lot of other things that could happen, but I think we're facing the end of growth. So if you think about our economic pie as the area of this um, circle, energy, we learned in the first part of my lecture, is the most important ingredient to this pie. Um, but if energy uh, doubles in price, or then our pie can still be big, or even slightly bigger, but the benefits go down. So we talk about renewables, and I think renewables are very important to our future. In fact, eventually we're going to have to be at 100% renewables. But the arguments that are being made for renewables, they're asking the wrong question. The red line here on a hypothetical curve is the price of energy we need to continue economic growth. And decreasing price of renewables and increasing price of fossil fuels both intersect above that line. So I think um, the question is, how do we fill that hole in there? And that's going to have to come from human behavior and demand. So um, much like a child might cry when we uh, lose uh, the, the myth of Santa Claus, um, adults might have to respond to, this isn't a disaster, but economic growth is probably ending. In fact, for 90% of Americans, economic growth has already ended. Since 2007, 90% of Americans have less take-home pay. Um, things are getting a little bit more expensive, uh, et cetera. 28% of Americans have less than a month worth of living expenses. 43% of Americans have less than three months. If they lost their job, they would be totally broke within three months. So some good news is that uh, primary energy per capita doesn't exactly correlate with subjective well-being. If you look at how much um, energy use the United States has versus Netherlands, we use almost twice as much, yet they're just as happy as we are by subjective well-being studies. Uh, interestingly, the Philippines, people there use just about as much energy as we do, yet we're, um, I, I'm sorry, they're just as happy as we are, but we use 38 times the energy that they do. So the average American uh, uh, has an energy footprint of 231,000 kilocalories, yet our bodies only need 2,500. So we have an 80 to 91 buffer. We're not broke. Our economic system might be insolvent, but we're not broke. There's a lot of room for benign trajectories in the future that use less energy and resources. Um, so it's been shown on the bottom that as you increase your GDP um, or your, your wealth, your survival and well-being and happiness increases very sharply from a, a, a very low starting point. If you have very little wealth, you get huge benefits from a little bit wealth added to you. But those top out at around 60 or $65,000. And then the more money you get after that, there's very little incremental um, benefit. So I would argue that um, in what's facing society, a natural uh, response would be contraction and convergence towards this, this pink circle. OK, well, I'm glad you're all awake, because now you're, now, now's why I, I put this together today uh, for Earth Day, uh, is a synthesis of you know, what are we going to do, and, and what does this all mean? 
So hell on earth in the past ends when excess CO2 is banked underground. And it begins again when it enters the air and the oceans. And this switch has been off for over 100 million years. Um, and life has flourished. And we are now, as a species, just getting tall enough to be able to throw the switch. But we're not mature enough to know what that means. Um, and maybe the wiring of the switch isn't uh, quite what we expect as well. Because when fossil carbon was sequestered underground, that happened before termites had evolved. Um, so the, the same sort of sequestration may not happen in the future. So all the environmental success stories in this country happened with a smoking gun. Chlorofluorocarbons, the ozone layer, um, DDT, unleaded gasoline, we all saw what was happening and we rallied around it and did something. The biggest environmental problem we face now is a risk. Is it 10%? Is it 50%? Is it 80%? What are the chances of a climate Armageddon? I don't think anyone knows, even the climate scientists, but it is non-zero and it's very scary. So instead of a smoking gun, it's more like Russian roulette. If we think about the IPC scenarios about the year 2100, that sounds so distant. 2100 is much closer to us than World War I was. That's 100 years versus 86 years. It's not that far away. So what's an armadillo for? What a silly question. It's not for anything. But we frame things using language, and that defines what they mean to us. And many of the things in our cultural system are defined from an anthropocentric standpoint. What do they do for us? What do they do for humans? A 10 million board feet of forest. It's not board feet, it's a bunch of trees, it's trees. Fish stocks, they're not stocks, they're populations of fish. And that brings me to my point that fossil fuel, we've lost half the battle when we call it fuel. The technical name is fossil hydrocarbon or fossil carbon. We've chosen to use it for fuel. But if you call it fossil fuel, of course we're going to burn it. Um, so I think there's, there's power in, in language. So a month ago, a good friend of mine sent me a very disturbing video, which I don't recommend you watch. Uh, because if you watch it, you, it, the images won't leave your, your head for a while. But it was a video of a chimpanzee in the Honolulu Zoo that had found a cane toad in its cage and proceeded to um, successfully orally assault the cane toad. And this was kind of shocking to me, but as I was watching it, I was thinking, that experience does nothing for that chimp's fitness. It does nothing for its survival. It does nothing for its reproduction. But yet it found it in its new environment, and it's just having its way with it. And I'll point out that after he was done, he tucked it under his, his shoulder and kind of carried it around. Why do I bring this up? Because we're doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing to the planet with the nuclear football and the thousand dollar a plate bluefin sushi and the cutting off rhino horn that sells for a hundred thousand uh, dollars a kilogram, which is twice the weight of gold, or the shooting dolphins to use as bait to catch a shark, which then you just cut the fin off because it's magical. Um, or sitting in the stands at NASCAR and watching cars race around really fast to get dopamine while CO2 lingers upwards. We are doing the same thing that this monkey was doing. And it makes me wonder if there were some alien gamekeeper that came here and saw what we were doing, what, what would he think? What would they think of the human enterprise? So in the 1900s, Uncle Tom's Cabin was the most read um, fiction work and it pissed a lot of people off. And it actually um, participate, you know, was instrumental in, in the Civil War, et cetera. But now today we have uh, virtual technology, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have blogging. And so A, people are, are not able to read as much as they were because our neural hijack is, we're so impatient. And B, and more importantly, is we do small things and we're concerned and anxious about the future and we do, 
we get angry and we write a blog post or we send out a tweet, I'm not gonna stand this anymore. And it's, okay, we drive a Prius or we recycle our cans. And it's like, okay, I'm doing something. And it diffuses the natural human social angst that is um, historically been a call to action. Uh, I will suggest that in this movement, the sustainability movement, there need to be a lot more women uh, for three reasons. Number one, is that men in these things where they're putting together graphs and look at this oil depletion and I was so clever to figure all this out and hey, did you see my blog post? And it's like a status thing. People, the, the, the early adopters of a lot of these climate change, financial, sustainability are a lot of men looking to be uh, bigger fish in a smaller pond. It's a natural thing. Um, women aren't, they just, what do I do? I wanna make things better, what, what can I do? That's number one. Number two is women have less steep discount rates than men. For evolutionary reasons, um, they care more about the future than men do. Uh, if men so much as see a picture of a bra, uh, that activates the neural dopamine reward highway and they consume more stuff. Um, even if it's unsexual, it's they, they go shopping or they consume more things just from that little cue. And women don't react the same way. And third and most importantly is we're about to be headed into a stressful period in our history and things are gonna to get tougher. There's gonna to be less every year instead of more. And it's been shown that women have, in periods of stress, not only do they have empathy, they have more empathy than when they're not stressed. And men are the opposite. Men have less empathy in periods of stress. So uh, summing, uh, we turn energy and resources into dollars and dollars into feelings plus waste. And we will always do this or something like this. So the challenge is how do we use less energy and resources to get the same sort of feelings with less waste? So we also have to consider uh, intergenerational equity. And I would argue we have to consider interspecies and ecosystem equity. So right now our financial system is taking an outsized share of the focus of our culture and our society when it's just one of many of these things. And I think a more sustainable future system is finance will be what it was supposed to be, facilitate uh, the, the economic, environmental, um, you know, harmony. So I'm not sure what is more profound, the fact that we evolved or the fact that we figured all this out. So what makes us different than generations before, in addition to the fossil energy, is that we've figured all this out. It's pretty amazing, and I think it's profound that we have to use that science and use that information to make the future better. So I think a lot of people are frustrated. Um, I know some of my friends in this room are because they've been shouting that we need to change for a very long time. And I would argue there's not one simple thing you can do right now, um, but you can have a conversation with yourself and commit that someday you are going to stand up for issues about, I will not stand for dead oceans full of slime and jellyfish. I will not stand for a sixth grade extinction or for climate change disrupting the planet. And make this contract with yourself. Don't make it with your friends, yeah, I signed up for that as a status thing, make it as a definer of who you are. Because if you're one of the people standing at the beach and someone's drowning and it happens you're the only one that knows how to swim, well that is kind of upon you to save the drowning person. Okay, conclusions. Uh, money is a marker for energy and those uh, relationships have, have decoupled. For most people, growth is already over. The primary drivers of economic growth, cheap energy and available credit are waning. There is no shortage of energy, but a longage of expectations. We have plenty of energy. We just think that the future is gonna be like this, and it's, it's probably not. Uh, biology determines what we need. Culture determines how we get it. Uh, lower consumption, more local and regional future is, is highly likely, not because we choose it, but because it's on the horizon. Uh, what sort of future do we want? What are we willing to give up? Okay, so before I do my con final conclusion, I'll just share with you briefly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working with Stanford University to come up with an open protocol um, tool 
where we measure our assets in make decisions using energy and natural resources instead of dollars. So all the inputs are energy and maybe we can make better decisions about energy. I'm also educating people about the importance of energy uh, as a driver of societies. Um, we have a, a, a campaign called It's Nobody's Fault because when humans are, are stressed, they naturally um, choose an outgroup and blame things on them. It's the Chinese, it's the environmentalists, it's the Republicans, it's the rich. Um, it's really nobody's fault what we're facing, except our fossil slaves are asking for a pay raise, and that means less benefits for us. So I think to deflect some of that social angst is important. Uh, I'm also doing something called the New American Way, which is um, how to be, live exciting, meaningful lives with maybe a little bit less instead of more every year. And the true uh, American dream was largely um, subsidized by huge amounts of cheap fossil energy, which we still have a lot of, but it's getting more expensive and there are climate impacts. So we're probably gonna have to deal with less and that can be exciting. I'm also just trying to be a better person, um, which, uh, you know, trying to, just be a better person, which, which includes being a clown at times, because I think dealing with this stuff, uh, David, you're smiling, because we've been reading this intense stuff for so long that it becomes toxic. So you have to just be human and be silly and playful uh, as well. Uh, and then I'm finally, I'm, I'm working, uh, as, as Jeremy mentioned, with the Bottleneck Foundation, which is, I don't know what's gonna happen in the next 10 or 20 years. I can pretty much know what's gonna happen in the next 200 years. And we need to be, who is thinking about a 100-year plan or a 500-year plan or a 1,000-year plan? None of us. We need to be thinking about what sort of infrastructure, what sort of knowledge, what sort of ethic, what sort of species, what sort of ecosystems do we propel through the next hundreds of years? So what can universities be doing here at Point? I just had some suggestions. More skills and knowledge applicable and relevant to a future with less stuff and more environmental constraints. We need to think about, ask, and address more relevant questions rather than just the reductionist um, for-profit questions. We, need, we do continue to need detailed expertise and specialization. Perhaps the academy can stop rewarding hyper-specialization associated with such reductionism. Perhaps the poets, artists, and social scientists can envision a new desirable ends, and then the natural scientists and techies can construct a way to get there. Uh, stop being such pussies, as, as should the rest of us. A highly educated, disciplined mind is a terrible thing to waste. So what can you be doing? Learn something new and learn something old. I think uh, we are in the technology age. You have to learn computer programming if that's your vocation. But maybe Google might not always be available to look up how to skin a deer if you killed one. You gotta learn some things. My girlfriend is learning how to drive horses uh, to haul logs and stuff. We've decoupled from uh, the skills from just only a generation or two generations ago. Give something up. I have a long list of things that I use every week um, I've been me meaning to write a post on it, but I never get around to it. Um, we use so many different things during our week, and some of those may not be available in the future. So when I say give something up, I don't say it to save the planet or the environment, but just to, to, to be more mentally flexible yourself. And um, every public talk I give, I committed earlier in the year to give something up. Um, and I don't I'll tell you what I gave up last week. I gave up pork. But I'm not gonna tell you what I'm giving up tonight because it's, it's a personal thing. And I don't wanna brag about it. I just, this is what I'm doing as one way to kind of meet uh, depletion part way. Start thinking, instead of financial capital, start thinking in terms of real capital, social, built, human, and natural. Like yourself. Every once in a while, every year or two, I do an exercise where I imagine myself on my deathbed. And it's a little uncomfortable if you've done it because if you have a good imagination, you can get kind of freaked out. But then I say, what would I have liked to have done that I didn't do? And none of us can be president or maybe probably save climate change or save the world, but we can like ourselves. We can be the type of people that we should be, be kind to animals, be kind to young, children, be, I mean, do 
we intuitively know, without institutions or religions or anything, we intuitively know right from wrong. And we can be the people that we know inside our heads. And I, I think that actually can be paid forward and, and interact with other people and be a very good thing. And these things are very deep and heady and scary. And I think to be part of a group and talking them through is very helpful. So in, in closing, I'll, I'll get back to my own story. Jeremy said, I uh, worked on Wall Street. So as a young man in my teens and, and 20s, I pursued novelty, things that were interesting, games and, and television programs. And then I had my job in my 20s and early 30s, and I, and I pursued rich people. I wanted to contact people that had a lot of money because that helped my career. And then in my late 30s and early 40s, I tried to surround myself with people who knew more than I did. I was very craving knowledge, and I wanted to be surrounded by people that knew a lot about how the real world worked in energy and ecology. And now in my mid-40s, I'm trying to surround myself with people that have higher ethics and moral principles than myself. And it's my hope that this similar trajectory is what humans can aspire to do and accomplish. Thank you for coming.